Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I, my name is Jay, and I have a couple of quick housekeeping chores I'd like to go through before I introduce the moderator. What you all should be seeing now is a screen showing our primary speakers, Philip, uh, Senator Holbeck, and, and uh, Trevor Loudon, and uh, they will be joining us in just a little while. I wanted to point out a couple of things on your screen. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button, which we will be using tonight, assuming that you want to. There's also a chat button, which we will not be using tonight. Uh, towards the end, we will have a question and answer session, and you may uh, ask questions, and we will answer as many as we can. Now, we won't start answering until the end, uh, and we'll let you know when that is. However, we invite anybody to, to send in a question by clicking on the Q&A button at any time. So if something comes up and you don't wanna forget about it, you can go ahead and send it in. Uh, and we'll look at, we'll have them all and we'll, uh, we'll get through as many as we can at the end. Uh, lastly, you'll notice uh, at the top of the screen is a little box that says webinar host, which represents a video feed, which is, uh, is turned off right now. And you'll see, of course, the uh, the Colbeck banner. Uh, I wanted to point out to you that if you move your mouse cursor to the top of the screen, there is a place where it says uh, video um, options, uh, view options rather. And if you choose, you can click on that and you can select what they call the side-by-side -side mode, which will move the speaker video to the side. And you can then click the mouse on a vertical line between the PowerPoint, the slide, and the speaker, slide it from left to right, and you can decide how large or small you want each one to be. And that's just for your viewing convenience. That is all I have. Uh, Dick, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to you. You can uh, turn on your mic. And uh, Dick is our moderator, and he's gonna get us going here. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yeah, we're, <clears throat> we're happy to welcome everybody on the webinar and we appreciate your support uh, for our efforts. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about immigration in the states, how states can support uh, the Trump immigration policy and we're fortunate to have of course Senator Patrick Colbeck uh, as well as uh, Trevor Loudon and Philip Haney joining us. Now why are Philip and Trevor who do not live in Michigan uh, speaking to us tonight and basically supporting uh, Patrick Colbeck and his position um, on uh, immigration? Well, the answer is that the whole country uh, is impacted by what's going to happen in Michigan. On August the 7th, we have a primary, we will make history, and it's really important to understand uh, why national experts like Trevor and Philip are reaching out to make sure all of Americans understand how important immigration is, how important the election uh, in Michigan is in the primary on August the 7th, and why they support Senator Patrick Colbeck and his support for the Trump immigration policy. Um, our first speaker tonight is going to be Trevor Loudon. I think uh, some of you certainly, uh, I've met most of you are familiar with Trevor. As you know, he's the editor-in-chief of uh, TrevorLoudon.com. He's an author and a filmmaker. Um, he's spoken, probably many of you have heard him in the past, you probably know. Uh, he's got that uh, New Zealand accent that we really enjoy. Um, he, he's been researching the radical left and Marxism and terrorist movements and Islam for, for many, many years. Uh, his latest efforts are uh, on a documentary film, uh, which is entitled The Enemies Within. Uh, you know he's done The Enemies Within uh, other, other uh, places, but this is The Enemy Within the Church. And so that's, we're looking forward to that coming out very, very soon. So Trevor, would you go ahead and uh, bring us up to speed on your perspective on immigration and uh, why you are supporting uh, Patrick Colbeck? Well, I think uh, supporting Patrick is a bit of a no-brainer in that you've got a very critical election coming up in Michigan, which is going to take the state one of two ways, and consequently with the country one of two ways. Now, on one side, you've got a gubernatorial candidate, Abu al-Sayed, who is backed by the radical left and obviously by various Muslim Brotherhood front groups as well. And that, they will nationalize that race. They desperately want to get a Muslim, uh, a radical left Muslim, in as the governor of Michigan. On the other side, you've got Patrick Colbeck, the man who brought right to work to Michigan, which uh, shocked me no end, and, and a man who has made a very firm stand supporting the president's immigration policies, um, 
which are the first sane and rational immigration policies I think we've had for a long time. Now, my view on immigration is very simple. Um, the first is you don't confuse immigration with illegal aliens, immigrants with illegal aliens. They're the, they're the same as confusing a guest with a burglar. So that's, we make that clear, you know, um, the, but the left is going crazy right now talking about, oh, we can't deport immigrants. Well, nobody's deporting immigrants. The only people who get deported are illegal aliens, which is a very, very different matter. Now, the purpose of, of, of promoting illegal immigration and, and even widespread immigration from countries uh, antithetical to America is, is very simple. The left understands that to take over Western Europe, to take over America, you have to destroy the conservative Christian voting base. And so you need to dilute that base by bringing in lots of people who do not share those values and are actually hot, in many cases hostile to those values. Now that has been the case in Europe where the left um, really went overboard trying to bring as many immigrants uh, from third world countries and particularly Islamic countries into Europe as they could with predictably disastrous results. And they're trying to do the same thing in this, company, in this country. Now I want to I just um, do a little bit of math here for people. Now you, Mitt Romney lost his election for the Republican Party by about two and a half million votes. Donald, uh, Donald Trump won by about 180,000 votes, I believe, and actually lost the popular vote by over two million. So it was a very tight run thing, and, and, and thank God for the Electoral College is all I can say. But now there, in this country right now, there are between 12 and 40 million illegal immigrants, illegal aliens, I should say. Now we know that when they're given citizenship and voting rights, as Hillary Clinton promised to do within 100 days of taking office, we know that those people will vote in huge numbers for the Democratic Party, maybe up to 80%. So you would have, the Democrats would get maybe 10, even up to 20, 30 million new voters. Now you can see what that's going to do to the politics of this country. Texas would go blue, Georgia would go blue, North Carolina would go blue, Arizona would go blue. A whole bunch of states would go blue and you would effectively have one party rule in this country from that point in time. You know, I, I, I joke sometimes that if 80% of the illegal immigrants in this country were reliable conservatives, conservative voters, Obama would have had the biggest wall on the border you have ever seen. He would have had the National Guard down there, you name it. And, um, so if you look at Michigan specifically and the Midwest, you know, where are most of the Islamic refugees coming? Where are the most Islamic, um, many of the Islamic and, and illegal aliens coming to? They're coming in, well, the refugees, the Islamic refugees are being put in the Midwestern states into South Dakota, Minnesota, Michigan, Iowa, etc. They're not going into Boston and Baltimore and um, San Francisco and LA because the left already owns those cities. So they're going into the Midwest, the heart of the conservative Christian voting base to basically wreck those communities, dilute the voting base in those areas and to turn all of those states blue and radical at the same time. In, in, in your state this year, you have three very critical races, I believe. One is obviously the gubernatorial race, um, and I hope it's going to be Patrick uh, versus Abu al-Sayed. I think that's how it's going to play out. The other is in District 13, we have got Rashida Tlaib, who is standing for the old, um, for Congress, for, for John Conyers' old seat. Now, she is both a Muslim extremist 
and a member of your largest Marxist group in the state, Democratic Socialists of America. And then you've got the Secretary of State race. We have got Jocelyn Benson standing again for that office. I think she last stood in 2010, where she was backed by George Soros's Secretary of State project and by Democratic Socialists of America and by the um, Arab American Political Action Committee. So I'm sure she'll be backed by those same people again. So this is the unholy alliance. You've got the Marxist groups, DSA, Communist Party USA, Workers World Party, which are all very strong in your state. You've got um, the Muslim uh, radical groups, CARE and, and, and others. And you've also got the Soros influence through the Secretary of State project, which was designed to get as many left-wing secretaries of state elected as possible because they are the ones who count the votes. And as Stalin said, it's not who votes that counts, it's who, ca who counts the votes that counts. So Michigan has got, is facing three very, very important elections this year. Immigration is gonna be a key component of that. So you've got two competing schools of thought those who believe that America should be for Americans and Americans should make the decisions at the ballot box on, on how America goes. And those who believe that America is a curse on the face of the earth and the best way to destroy this country is to import millions of new voters who do not share America's constitutional values and want to bring this country to its knees. And I want to add one little point when we're specifically talking about Islamic um, settlement. And now a lot of Muslims adhere to Sharia law. They believe in, in, in the law of Allah. Sharia is Allah's law dictated in the Quran. It's dictated directly from Allah. And every good Muslim has the obligation to make Sharia the dominant law of the land. When I came to this country, I had to swear an oath that I'd never been involved in any political group, communist or Nazi, that sought to overthrow or undermine the US Constitution. That was the law, that was what I had to sign up to. And I think that's fair enough. Now, if you're a Muslim who believes in Sharia law, which many of them do, or good observant ones do, you are advocating a political system that seeks to overthrow or undermine the US Constitution. So if I can't come here, if I'm a communist or a Nazi, why should I be allowed to come into this country if I advocate Sharia law? Now, I think that's a very important point we need to stress. This is not a religious objection. This is a political objection. Nobody's worried about Buddhists coming into the country or Hindus or Sikhs. It's all about Islam because Islam is the only religion in the world that obligates the spread of totalitarian political, a totalitarian political ideology and is very happy to convert people by the sword. In fact, obligates converting people by the sword. So I think that's all I need to say on immigration. Immigration is a positive thing when it's done constructively and brings people in that will add to American values. It's an extremely destructive and divisive thing when it brings in people who really do not have this country's interest at heart and don't care about your values. And that's been the guiding ethos of the immigration system in your country since the 1960s. And we're seeing the fruits of that here, just as we're seeing the fruits of it in Europe. And it is not pretty. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, we appreciate your, your crispness. And we are going to get to questions and answers where we can amplify uh, your points and understand them fully. And I think you've articulated why you are supporting Patrick. Uh, he has been very clear and has taken action, uh, not rhetoric, but action related to these topics of immigration, whether it was refugee resettlement, um, or his position related to uh, illegal aliens and, and sanctuary states. So uh, if you have questions, please push the Q&A button. We're going to monitor those and ask those in the second part of the, of the, of the evening. Right now, we're going to bring on uh, Philip Haney. And Philip, as you know, uh, is uh, uh, retired from the federal government honorably. Uh, he was uh, 
one of the founding members of, in the formation of the Department of Homeland Security. He worked for Customs and Border, Border Patrol. He has a very, very special story to talk about in terms of a, as a law enforcement officer, uh, the challenges that, uh, that he faced. And um, uh, Philip, are you with us? Can we, can we bring Philip in now and, and his, uh, his remarks? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I think you need to put your camera back on there, Philip. Yeah, we're not seeing your camera. Is that little lower left-hand corner? It's on. Okay, try turning it off and on again and make sure it's aimed correctly. Do I have to turn mine off, perhaps? No. Um, you, you can go ahead and do you can turn yours off, Trevor. You know what? We have Philip's voice. We have Philip's slides. If we need to, we can have Philip talk, and uh, uh, we can work with the slide set and just move on with Philip without without the, vid the video for now. I'm going to go ahead and bring your slides up, uh, and you can go ahead and begin. I'm not seeing anything on my screen. I'm sorry. All right, Philip. The first one is who wants to shut down ICE? I can tell you I can work your way through the slides. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, we've got a number of slides. We'll just keep up with you as you talk to them. Okay. The beginning of the PowerPoint discussed is uh, the what is the government's role in immigration. And I cited the Constitution, Article 1, which says that the U.S. government is responsible for a uniform naturalization policy. So one of the primary responsibilities of the federal government is to simply have a uniform immigration and naturalization law and policy and that it would be enforced. That's Article 1 of the Constitution. The 14th Amendment, as well, states that states must enforce law uniformly with both citizens, with all the people that live in the state. And they're, they're not allowed to enforce law in favor of one group or another, which is the whole basis of why sanctuary cities are illegal according to the Constitution, because to create sanctuary cities is favoring one group, in this case immigrants, over another group, which in this case is, are U.S. citizens. Now moving on from there, the question is, who is opposing the enforcement of immigration law? And we have been seeing lately an outburst of rage and protest, primarily among four groups that are that are have a lot of uh, visibility in the mainstream media lately the first one is the democrats themselves they are calling openly for ice immigration and customs enforcement to be shut down and disbanded and using terms like uh, a terrorist group or nazis for simply enforcing the laws that protect our national security that are mandated by the U.S. Constitution. So we have elected officials who are openly calling for the abolishment of one of the three primary agencies that was created when Department of Homeland Security was initiated in the year 2003. My agency was Customs and Border Protection we were the ones that encountered these people that were crossing into America at the border, literally. ICE is supposed to help us as a partner in law enforcement to apprehend and deport people that have gotten through the border and are here illegally. The groups that are calling for the shutdown of ICE and uh, not only ICE but also Customs and Border Protection include the Democratic Socialists of America. Another group is the Women's March, which is organized by, among others, Linda Sarsour, who is a member of the Islamic Society of North America, 
which is the largest front group for the Muslim Brotherhood operating in the United States. The other groups is the group that's involved. There are three main left Antifa socialist groups that are driving this protest movement. It's called Families Belong Together. This coalition of uh, probably 125 to 150 different leftist groups around the country also includes the Council on American Islamic Relations, another front group for the Muslim Brotherhood. So for at least two of the three national level organizations that are protesting for the shutdown of ICE, no walls, no borders, no immigration enforcement, two of those three groups include embedded within them, woven into the fabric of their organizational structure, the Muslim Brotherhood. Now recently you may have heard about protests at the Hart Senate building in Washington DC. That was on the 28th of June, where somewhere around 650 women were arrested in the Hart Senate building for disturbing the peace and they were calling for the shutdown of ICE. Among those who organized that protest was Linda Sarsour, the very same person who also endorsed Abdul Al Sayed, who is currently a candidate in the primary for a Democratic candidate for governor in Michigan. So you have a a point of contact between the socialist leftist groups that are operating to have no walls, no borders, not our president, shut down ICE, shut down CBP, shut down law enforcement, contact directly between those groups and the candidate for governor in Michigan. Linda Sarsour endorsed Abdul Al side at the ISNA conference in Chicago in November of 2017. So you have this overlap and that's the reason why I support Patrick Kolbeck because Patrick Kolbeck stands up for constitutional principles. That by the way is what makes a person a statesman rather than merely a politician. So you have a candidate who is openly affiliated with anarchist groups who want to shut down law enforcement, border control, and immigration regulation who are openly supporting this particular candidate for governor. And specifically, I'm referring to Linda Sarsour, one of the founding organizers of the women's movement called the Women's March, who was also arrested in the Hart Building calling for support of Abdul Al Sayed as candidate for governor in Michigan. Patrick Colbeck makes it plain that he stands up for constitutional principles. And that's what this whole issue is really all about, is our sovereignty, America's right to protect its borders, protect itself from threats, both foreign and domestic, versus a candidate who's calling for open anarchy, endorsed by open anarchists, who would be a governor, and we can only guess what kind of policies would be implemented if he was actually elected. So with that, I will tell you thank you for listening. And um, that will be the end of my portion of the presentation. Well, thank you, Philip. We're going to have Philip and Trevor back for Q&A. I want to make a point. When you look at that picture with Linda Sarsour and Abdul El Sayed, remember that it's federal information on donations identify the fact that 45% of the donations to Abdul El Sayed's campaign to be the governor of Michigan come from outside of Michigan. That's striking. 45% of the money to get him elected to be the governor of Michigan comes from outside of the state. And that's significant. That's one of the reasons, frankly, that we're reaching out in a webinar tonight to people around the country to understand this issue, to understand the impact that Michigan can have on the rest of the country on the topic of immigration in particular and to understand, uh, to get to know Patrick Kolbeck and uh, his position on this topic. And uh, actually, we're going to bring Patrick on now. Uh, Patrick, as you know, is a state senator in Michigan. Um, he's an announced his candidacy. Uh, he's been aggressively reaching across the state. He has principal solutions on many, many topics. But I think he would agree that immigration is very, very high on his priority list. Patrick, can you join us now? Yep.
Thank you very much, Dick. Appreciate it. And I want to thank uh, Secure Michigan, all the folks from Secure Michigan, for all their efforts to track everything that's going on here in the state of Michigan. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Phil for all your support and getting the truth out here in the state of Michigan. And obviously, Trevor Loudon, thank you very much for your support and, uh, and getting the truth out nationally on our behalf as well. I appreciate uh, everything you guys are doing to get the word out on something, on a topic that most people don't want to talk about. Um, frankly, I'm, a, I'm currently serving as a state senator. I never thought I'd have to dig into immigration issue as a state senator. After all, that's a federal issue. But uh, the fact of the matter is we do have to deal with it as a, at a state level. And Trevor highlighted some of the reasons for that in his uh, opening discussion when he was talking about how people are trying to shift the demographics in the states, particularly in states that are starting to trend towards the red, they're using immigration as a policy to go off and shift it to the blue. And, uh, and in the process, um, you know, you've got to be aware of what's actually happening in your respective states. And I started popping up in awareness when I got a briefing on the Syrian refugee program back a few years ago. And it was under that briefing that I learned that we didn't actually pick who came to our country. It was actually picked by the United Nations. And there was no screening process to determine whether or not somebody from a, a state like Syria, which is one of the uh, words in ISIS, if you will, the Islamic State in Syria, um, and whether we weren't even screening them to see whether or not these guys were indeed terrorists. And so that was a concern of mine. I fostered a resolution that encouraged our Governor Snyder to uh, on the pause button until we figured out how to screen people so we could honor our first responsibility as elected officials, as government officials, and that is to secure the rights of the governed. Seems pretty basic, right? Well, um, we had one hearing on my resolution, and I can tell you that uh, Dawood Walid, with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, got a group of at least 60 people um, to testify in opposition. I got called every name in the book. And uh, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, uh, name calling is the last resort of the intellectually bankrupt. <laughs> when they have nothing else to say, they're going to start calling you names rather than address the core issue. And that's what happened at this hearing. And uh, I'll tell you, I dug in my heels. Dick Manasseri was there. He, uh, he was exemplary in his testimony. Um, and I uh, appreciate that. But it, it highlighted that they're, uh, this is something that they are willing to go off and say anything and do anything to go off and protect these policies that have been put in place by Barack Obama and crew. And uh, we have to be wary of what's going on at the state level. Um, this led to further discussion and investigations on my part as a state official and investigative sanctuary cities. Well, it turns out Michigan actually has four cities in the state of Michigan that have sanctuary style policies. The city of Lansing, the city of Ann Arbor, city of Ypsilanti, city of Detroit. And we also have a county that has a countywide uh, sanctuary policy and that's Washtenaw County. Um, we, and as uh, Trevor was mentioning, as Phil was mentioning, we actually have a candidate for governor that I believe is gonna be the democratic nominee, uh, Dr. Abdul Al Sayed. Um, who believes that we should be a sanctuary state, a la California. Obviously, that's something that's very concerning to me as somebody who took an oath to support the Constitution. Um, so uh, I went off and I've supported uh, resolutions for No Sanctuary for Criminals Act. That's a federal act, but I made sure that we instituted a state policy where we supported that policy. I also co-sponsored legislation to support Kate's law. Um, many of you might be familiar with that. But as we flash forward into the election, I ran into this issue head on um, by identifying some concerns we had with folks that did not have the best interests of the United States in mind. Um, there's an or the organization, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, it turns out that uh, this is this organization has been designated a terrorist organization by majority Muslim countries like Egypt, Syria, and the United Arab Emirates. And the Democratic candidate for governor that we keep talking about, Abdul Al Sayed, actually is affiliated with an organization that is um, uh, tied to the Muslim Brotherhood. It's actually the Muslim Students Association. He was a vice president of that organization. His wife uh, was president of that organization. Um, this organization was actually formed by the Muslim Brotherhood back in 1963. Uh, the creed that they, they recite at uh, many of their gatherings states, uh, Al Hu Akbar, Jihad is my spirit, I will die to establish Islam. That is not the Boy Scout oath. That is something that we should all be concerned about and be able to have an adult conversation as to whether or not 
that sort of approach to governance, that kind of attitude in a gubernatorial candidate is something we want here in the state of Michigan. And ultimately, uh, this led to a debate forum where I was present with Abdul El Sayed in front of 150 members of the Michigan Press Association. And uh, during that discussion, I highlighted his affiliations with the Muslim Brotherhood and why that was a concern. And he actually said the following words in front of 150 members of the Michigan Press Association. He said, you may not hate Muslims, but Muslims definitely hate you. That, my friends, is a definition of hate speech. Now, if I would have said something like that, uh, which I'd never do, um, it would have been not just statewide headline news, it would not just national headline news, it would have been global headline news. But you know what happened in the wake of him saying that? Not a peep. And uh, I think what we've got here is an issue that is, uh, it's got two prongs to it. First of all, we've got the core national security issue dealing with groups like Muslim Brotherhood, dealing with Democrats uh, attempting to shift our voting demographics to their benefit. But there's another issue that's more fundamental, and that deals with the fundamental freedom of speech. And uh, immediately when you go off and highlight associations like Abdul's with the Muslim Brotherhood, you're called every name in the book. And it's important for us to stand up for what is true. And, uh, um, and I'm not backing down. I've got the evidence to support that. My wife actually provided evidence of this affiliation to one of the uh, prominent uh, editors, uh, um, guy who's the editorial lead for the Detroit News here in Michigan. And uh, as, he pre as she presented it to him, he said, I don't want to hear it. Well, that's really what the media is doing right now. They don't want to hear this stuff. That's why it takes courageous people like Phil Haney and Trevor Loudon and Dick Manasseri to get the word out. And that's why we're doing this seminar. So I hope, uh, I look forward to hearing your questions as we go forward. But I want to thank everybody who's participating in this because this is a very important subject for a very important issue, and that's the security of our nation. Okay, Patrick, thank you. Uh, we've moved along quickly so we can get to questions. Uh, we want to kind of reinforce why we're doing a national webinar. And I think one way to answer that question would be to reach out. Um, I believe we're going to have all the panelists visible. Uh, and just reach out to Trevor. I'm just curious, from your perspective, Trevor, what would be the impact on the rest of the country if Abdul El Sayed is actually the governor of Michigan next January? Can you just give me your thoughts on that? Well, we see the impact in, in Europe and certain areas like the mayor of London, who's, who's a radical Muslim, and has per, he's been promoting hate speech law. That uh, The buses in London have Arab, you know, Arabic written all over them and this kind of thing. What he would do, as he says, he would try and make um, Michigan into a sanctuary state, which would draw in every Muslim radical in the country. You know, they would start screaming towards the country. You would have a big influx of, of Muslim, you know, militant Muslims from other parts of the country, and they would try and establish an enclave here, as they do in Europe. You know, there's certain parts of Europe where, where the voting base is so big that no politician dares to challenge them. So they would basically make um, Michigan effectively a Muslim state within America. That would be the long-term uh, you know, result of what he's trying to do as a beachhead for spreading their doctrines right throughout the Midwest. You know, Minnesota's pretty far gone. South Dakota would be in trouble. You know, they would keep on spreading this. They would use that as a base to spread the doctrines further. And what do you do? Because they're not breaking a law technically. Uh, they would have people in their government who are on their side, their secretary of state, their attorney general, all these sort of things would be backing them up. So you would have a state that's really an open rebellion against the federal government, much as California is now, but only this time would be much more Islamic based. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important to focus on uh, Patrick's policy so that people can understand them. Patrick, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions related to uh, this topic. Uh, what, do you, what is your position and how, how would you compare and contrast your position with your opponents, both on the Democratic and the Republican side? How about topics like welcoming Michigan? Maybe you can explain what welcoming Michigan and your position on, on whether you support it or not and what you think your opponents' uh, positions are. Well, Welcoming Michigan is a program here in Michigan specifically targeted to resettle immigrants and refugees 
into, um, as Trevor was alluding to before, uh, different areas that are kind of traditionally red areas of the state to go off and shift demographics. And they use a lot of our faith-based organizations who get about 97% to sometimes 99% of their funding um, through these programs to go off and resettle. So there's a monetary interest in a lot of these faith-based programs to do it. Obviously, there's a humanitarian interest in making sure that we protect people that are undergoing um, serious uh, issues with their um, their original nation here. And if they need to escape, escape their nation for um, uh, their own safety, I totally understand that. It's something we want to go off and support. Matter of fact, there's a lot of Muslims that come from majority Muslim countries that come to the United States because they're able to practice their faith in a way that is um, uh, acceptable to them and uh, they're not subject to persecution that they'll see in some other countries. Um, so as far as where the other uh, elected officials stand on this, I mean, we have uh, uh, Jim Hines who said he openly supported welcoming Michigan. Um, he backtracked since then, but uh, he, he, I don't think he understands what it truly is. Second of all, we've got um, Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly, who's supportive of that program with Governor Snyder. Um, we've got Bill Schuette, who who's all over the map. I mean, when Trump put out his travel ban uh, a while back and had 16 attorney generals support that travel ban, our attorney general was not one of those attorney generals, but Bill Schuette was silent. He was off duty. And he, since then, he's gotten a lot of pressure to, to uh, get back on that bandwagon and highlight it. But um, really, it's a concern because some of these immigrants are coming from nations that uh, have terrorist elements in them, and we're not screening for them. We're not screening effectively at all for them. And um, I want to be welcoming to people that are undergoing serious duress. But you know, there are also places in other countries um, that we can set up little sanctuaries for them there and take care of them there until we can figure out how to screen them for security purposes. And that's uh, um, something I'd like to start seeing happening if for, for the people that are concerned about their life. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, let's, let's ask Philip a question. Philip, yeah. give us uh, an understanding of, of the degree to which you believe that the Muslim Brotherhood is saturating uh, America uh, in general and Michigan in, in particular. Your, your saturation analogy would be helpful here. I think- Philip? Dropped off for a sec. Um, possible. I think I, I think Philip is off for just a moment. Uh, okay. Well, Philip does use an analogy of a sponge. Uh, he talks about the sponge being in water, and as anybody knows, sponge will gradually, slowly, or rapidly take on uh, more and more water, and then begin to sink. And he uses the word, the notion of saturation, to explain his perspective on how the Muslim Brotherhood has effectively, starting with the Muslim Student Association in 1963, as, as uh, Patrick said, begun to saturate the environment. Certainly in Michigan, the saturation is visible. Um, you can visit Michigan uh, in any number of towns and you will see Sharia compliant people on, on the street um, demonstrating their Sharia compliance and um, taking on jobs as principals and school board leaders and uh, newspaper editors and journalists for the, for the major newspapers, as well as being professionally involved in the medical profession. In fact, we have, and I think an example that Philip would use, we have the first FDM case, federally indictment in, federal indictment in Michigan, uh, but for many, many years that's been criminal in the country, and yet this is the first uh, and only uh, indictment indicating that the medical community uh, in Michigan is strong enough to uh, keep this quiet, at least the component of the medical community that is Sharia compliant. So, um, Let's move on to another question. Uh, Trevor, uh, we know that Keith Ellison is running for uh, attorney general, a statewide election in Minnesota. What's your take on that? And how does, how does that relate to the democratic socialists, the red green axis with Islam and the Democrats? Yeah, well, look, Keith Ellison is as much of a communist as he is a, a Muslim. He was um, elected with the help of the Communist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America. He is actively involved in many, um, look, he, he just appeared last week, two weeks ago in Minnesota at a big uh, Democratic Socialists of America organized health conference in that state. Um, he's another uh, Linda Sarsour friend and, and 
Just remember too that Linda Sarsour is also a member of Democratic Socialists of America. So we have to understand that, that mo many of the Muslim activists in this country are also Marxists. That includes people like Nihad Awad, the head of care, many of the leading care officials. They work all the time with um, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, Democratic Socialists of America, Communist Party USA, etc. So there's a complete alliance between the left and Islam in this country, and you see it playing out in Michigan, you see it playing out in Minnesota, all around the country. So um, yeah, they're trying to make the Midwest, they're trying to make Michigan, Minnesota, and I think South Dakota as well, into Muslim beachheads in this country. And if they can do that, that's going to be hugely divisive and cause, cause huge problems all over this country. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Patrick, I, we, we, uh, you, you've answered some information about the, the, the incompatibility of Sharia law, <clears throat> um, the Islamic Constitution, and the U.S. Constitution. Could you comment a little bit more on specific examples of criminal behavior that uh, we know uh, that is supported by Sharia um, but in fact, it's criminal behavior that, that affects the average person, particularly women and children. Yeah, actually, one of the most recent examples is a uh, practice that is Sharia compliant known as female genital mutilation. And it actually, uh, we found out about it, it was about a year ago, an example of some Somali refugees came from Minnesota to the town where I grew up in the city of Livonia here in Michigan and uh, conducted this, uh, this procedure on Two young women um, and uh, the legislature um, acted fairly quickly on it. I actually sponsored a couple pieces of legislation, got them passed into law, penalizing doctors who practice this. There was other ones that specifically banned it as a practice here in Michigan. There was a federal law banning it, but there was no state law and now we have a, a, probably one of the strongest anti-female genital mutilation uh, statutes or suites of statutes on the books to discourage that behavior in the future. That's one example. Another area is around human trafficking. Um, the idea of wife beating um, and spousal abuse is something that is uh, Sharia compliant that obviously has no acceptance here in our society. Um, and uh, those are just a couple of the more abhorrent uh, examples. I've also seen examples where on the financial side of fence, we had a restaurant chain here known as Lashish Restaurants that was practicing their Sharia compliant finance and going around the um, uh, sales tax laws that we have here in the state of Michigan and funneled about $20 million out to Hamas via what's called sales suppression software or a zapper. And so these are examples of these practices actually occurring right here in the state of Michigan um, that are in clear violation of our statutes and our laws and it's something that needs to be um, exposed when it happens and uh, we need to recognize there's a there's a big push by a lot of people that for this one world government the idea of a borderless society and what we lose sight of when we're pushing or not when, when those people are pushing that policy what they're losing sight of is the fact that not all cultures are the same not all people in the world have the same set of values in america we have a very unique set of values we actually protect the sanctity of marriage and we don't think that wives or any spouse should be abused in their marriage. We don't think that somebody should have um, their uh, genitals mutilated uh, um, without uh, um, their consent. Um, so there's some pretty stark value differences here that stand in contrast to this idea of a one world society. Until everybody else shares the values that we do in America, which are based on Judeo-Christian principles, it's, um, it's tough to sit there and say we all share the same set of principles. This concept of freedom in general is something that is not shared all around the world. And uh, freedom of religion in particular is something that's not shared all around the world. We have something very precious and we need to defend it. Trevor, you've talked in the past about why it's important for not just Michigan to keep, keep uh, America from failing, but you, you've been articulate about why the rest of the world is dependent on America uh, to keep free so the rest of the world can begin to can continue to be free. 
Well, you know, look, I, I come from a country, a, a lot of people come to me and say, look, if things turn bad in America, can I come and live in New Zealand? Because they sort of see New Zealand as this far away place in the South Pacific, it's always going to be free. But the Chinese have worked their way right through the Pacific. They pretty much control Tonga and Fiji and Samoa and the Cook Islands. They're buying up our politicians. They're buying up our farmland, our utilities, our, our lot of, uh, a lot of immigration into the country. So, so we have got a very bad problem of Ch communist Chinese infiltration. Um, the Islamic problem is less in my country. It's the population is probably still under 1%, but Australia has a very big problem with um, Islamic infiltration, that the population there is up to 4% or even higher. And i just make a little point there too. Um, in Australia after World War II, they took a lot of Lebanese into the country and about 40% of them were Lebanese Muslims and about 60% were Lebanese Catholics. Well, the Lebanese Catholics have done very well, thank you very much. They're, they're doctors and lawyers and engineers. The Lebanese mo Muslims, not so much. Very heavily representative in the dry, crime figures, uh, gangs, etc. So look, if America goes down, we're gonna be living in a world dominated out of Moscow, Beijing, Havana, Tehran, and you know, the various Muslim capitals. If America goes down, there is no one that can stand this red-green axis that's intent on tyrannizing the world. You know, America, why, why, you know, why do you think this immigration is happening, this refugee resettlement? It's because a long time ago, your enemies decided it was a very dangerous game to try and take America on militarily. So you use your freedoms, you use your constitution to take this country down from the inside. This is exactly what they have been doing. And if America falls, you can kiss freedom goodbye on every country of the world. If there was a safe place to go to, I would be there. Believe me. Patrick, uh, thank you, Trevor. Patrick, um, I know that you've had some interaction with a few from outside the country, including uh, Katie Hopkins, who visited here. Yeah. Part of her message was to warn Michigan that she, she lives in London. London, nine million people elected Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, and she was very specific about the increase in crime, uh, the challenges to women. Uh, maybe you can say a few things about uh, why you reach out and interact with people like Katie and Trevor and Philip, and what you've learned about the potential for Michigan either to go in the direction of London or to reverse uh, the immigration. And by the way, of course, uh, you're the only candidate we're aware of that fully supports Donald Trump's position. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, first of all, Donald Trump is a breath of fresh air. And I, I, uh, I agree with Trevor. I mean, it is a, it's a total blessing that we got him in as our president because he will take on these issues and, and talk about them in a common sense sort of way uh, that is uh, sorely needed, especially in the wake of eight years under President Obama and his administration, which was actively seeking to undermine um, our security with some of the policies that they put forward. So uh, when you look abroad and you look at uh, what's going on in London, you look at what happened in uh, Molenbeek out in, in Belgium, um, when Katie confronted the mayor in Belgium uh, of uh, what was going on, because a lot of the terrorists that were identified in the Paris um, attack uh, actually came from Belgium, um, you notice what the reaction is, right? It's immediately to go off and try to silence people like uh, Katie, silence people like Tommy Robinson, for example, which is why I emphasize that this is really starting to boil down to a case of free speech. You see what's happening. If you look beyond England, you look beyond France, you look beyond Belgium, and look into the countries like Poland, what's going on there? What's going on in Austria? You'll notice that it's a, they they're taking a much different approach than the France's and the Germany's of the world. And they're saying, wait a second, we are gonna take a stand. They've got people leading that are saying, guys, not on my watch. They're seeing what's happening in these other countries and they're saying, no, we're not gonna have, let it happen here. That's why it's useful to go off and talk to people in other countries because 
they are kind of the mining canaries. And that's what Katie's message is. She's being our mining canary, letting us know that, guys, um, the path that we're currently headed on is not good. She's living it right now in her home country. And she does that as a patriot. She's a former intelligence officer. Um, she understands what it means to go off and defend her country. And she's gracious enough to go off and state that she wants to make sure that we can defend ourselves back here so that Trevor scenario that he was just talking about, about having nowhere, nowhere else to go, doesn't come to fruition here. Um, it is something very much of concern um, and uh, we can learn from our neighbors. And, uh, and I, I appreciate the question there, Dick. Patrick, we're almost, we're almost running out of time. Can you kind of um, give some feedback to the audience? We, the topic we're talking about is fairly uh, demoralizing, but I'm curious, and maybe Trevor has some insights. I know Pat, Philip does. When you travel around the state, uh, Patrick, you get the feeling that people are beginning to get this idea that this is not just a, a normal election, that there's some uh, historic things happening, and that August 7th is, in fact, going to be a history-making day with Michigan and deciding at the ballot box which direction it's going to go on. So what brings you a level of optimism? And uh, maybe you can also say a few things about uh, uh, how people in the audience can help, uh, either as volunteers or, or with some financial assistance. Well, first, kind of the bad news. I think still a lot of people are asleep to the fact that the Democratic nominee is not going to be Gretchen Whitmer. She's on her fourth campaign manager. It's going to be Abdul Sayed. The gentleman, you already talked about his financing. The um, external financing is significant for him. Internally, he's got the support of the organization that won Bernie Sanders for Michigan. It's a strong grassroots support team. You combine that with money, it is a very difficult um, uh, juggernaut to go off and stop. You need somebody like me that's going to actually speak truth to power in those situations because uh, I think most people, when they're actually given the truth about what Abdul Al Sayed is really about, uh, talk about his policy to make Michigan a sanctuary state, talk about his single payer health care plans, all the stuff that's, uh, that uh, I'm diametrically opposed to. Uh, I think it starts becoming clear that there's only one person who can defeat that juggernaut in the upcoming election. That's me. Now, in regards to an area of hope, is that there are a lot of people on the grassroots that are paying attention. The people that are plugged into this webinar right now, they are paying attention. The folks that are um, on the ground, there's an enthusiasm behind our campaign because I'm not afraid to speak truth to power. It's very reminiscent of what happened with Donald Trump here in the state of Michigan. We've got people sacrificially given of their time and treasure to go off and get the word out to people. It's that sort of enthusiasm that will win this election, the general election. If we put forward a politics as usual candidate on the Republican side, we're doomed to repeat this cycle where we follow eight years of Republican governor with uh, eight years of a Democratic governor. The good news is I think we're on the verge of a major upset here in the state of Michigan um, because of the hard work of the people that have been supporting our campaign. Well, thank you. And Trevor, maybe you can wrap it up with your reasons for endorsing Patrick and then we can move on to describe the, the up upcoming webinars. We have three more webinars to go, and we're going to be having them in July. We'll show you that in just a minute. But Trevor, can you kind of summarize for yeah. the audience why you're supporting Patrick? Look, I think this is a no-brainer. I think Abu al-Said will be the Democrat nominee because he's got a huge amount of out-of-state support. He's got the Bernie Sanders left-wing DSA Communist Party Muslim Brotherhood networks backing him with hundreds, if not thousands of people on the ground to door knock every, um, every, every low income area in the whole state and turn out huge numbers of people. So yeah, I think he will be the nominee. And as Patrick said, you're not going to beat that with just another Chamber of Commerce Republican the Chamber of Commerce, and somebody asked us, why does the Chamber of Commerce favor open borders? Because the Chamber of Commerce wants profits and they want profits through cheap labor. They don't give a damn about America's national security, unfortunately. So this is gonna be a very clear thing, a clear difference, and Patrick is the only one who will be able to attract national backing for his side. You know, you're going to have a, a Muslim Marxist basically standing on one side with national backing up against the business as usual Republican. Well, you know what's going to happen. The only chance we've got 
is if we have a, a, a tough constitutional Republican in the race who calls it out like it is and says it like it is, just like, you, you know, do you think Jeb Bush would have beat Hillary Clinton, for instance? So, you know, it took a Donald Trump to beat Hillary Clinton. Well, we need a, a Trump-like figure in Michigan to beat Ab, Abu al-Sayed. Now, Patrick's got a proven record. He's the man who got right to work in Michigan. And how, how easy was that, Patrick? Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> so that, <laughs> a lot of fun when your Senate Majority Leader is opposing you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, so that shows someone who's got a lot of courage of their convictions and the ability to get things done and to rally the troops. And you're going to need all of that to win this race. And you need someone of your character and personality and willingness to tell the truth to be able to rally that outside money and support those phone bankers from Minnesota, those the donors from Texas, the supporters from California that you're going to need because this is going to be a national race. So there's going to be a very clear difference here. So I think Patrick is the absolute only one who can do this. And I'm, I'm completely backing him on this. And I think Patrick can pull this off in a huge upset, both in the primary and the general. And we're going to be very, very happy campers after that election in November. Thank you, Trevor. Patrick, can you, can you take us through the last uh, set of uh, slides, letting us know about the upcoming webinars, the topics, and your other principal solutions? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank everybody who joined us here tonight. Um, sorry we weren't able to get through all the questions, but we're hopeful we got through a few of them. The next one deals with the little hole that uh, has been left in our country, which allows for a discussion to this one world government, and that's the, that is our civics education. So we're going to have Rick Green from Wall Builders and Catherine Engelbrecht from True the Vote. They're going to be talking about this very issue and why it's so important. Um, that's on Monday, July 16th. And that's going to be followed by the next week, we're going to have a discussion over health care. As many of you guys know, the Affordable Care Act was designed for control, not care. And so it kind of gets to what, uh, it's a little bit of an adjunct subject with what we've been talking about today, is other people want to control our destiny. We're the, we, have this, we value this little thing called freedom. And we talk about freedom as it relates to health care and free market health care solutions. We're going to have national expert Dr. Josh Umber and Dr. Lee Gross, who have been meeting with the Trump administration on health care policies, are going to be able to lend a lot of national insights on where we're going as a country on that. And I, I worked uh, hard with the uh, Trump transition team to make sure we had free market health care advocates. And these are two of the gentlemen that helped me in that endeavor. And they're going to be talking at a webinar on Monday, July 23rd. And then last, a subject that's near and dear to folks in Michigan, we're going to talk about roads and road construction with two folks that have advanced construction materials to help us with building roads that last longer. What a concept. And that's gonna be, we're gonna have Anil Sani and uh, Jeremy Minton join us with some of their um, solutions that never seem to find it into production here in Michigan because there's too many people focused on roads as a jobs program and not as a public service. Well, we're gonna talk about how to get it into public service mode on Monday, July 30th. So. Thank you guys, every, thank you everybody for joining us and I uh, appreciate your support and plugging in tonight and look forward to um, speaking with a lot of you guys next Monday. So Patrick has a number of principal solutions. You can learn a lot more about them at uh, the website, Colbeck for Governor. And uh, <clears throat> if you do decide that you'd like to continue your support uh, for Patrick uh, financially, you certainly can do that by registering for the next webinar, telling your friends, and there will be a full recording of tonight. So you will get a recording because you did uh, donate and you did register for the webinar. And we'd certainly invite you to share that with your friends and get, get them to consider both the donation to the campaign and the signing on for the webinar. We have uh, very few days. We have less than 30 days. So your efforts, your support, your due diligence to make an informed decision as you prepare for absentee voting or you prepare if you're outside of the state for uh, ongoing support for Patrick Colbeck. We certainly would appreciate uh, you making an informed decision about why Patrick Colbeck uh, can keep Michigan on the right track and keep Michigan as a full-fledged member of the United States of America following the Constitution and making sure that we do not go in the direction of London, for example. So thank you all and good night.